really close? Okay. Thank you all so much for coming to this, um, to Líneas Vitales. Um, I'm Jennifer Ponce de Leon, and you know, welcome to the Philadelphia Liberation Center. We're going to have uh, a short discussion here, so I wanted to go ahead and get that started. And um, before starting, I just wanted to mention that there is merch in the back that you are encouraged to check out, and also if you'd like to donate to the Liberation Center, you can also do that here in the back of the room. Um, so, as I said, I'm Jennifer, I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and writer, and I, most of my work focuses on leftist art and art as part of leftist social movements. Um, in the worlds that, you know, in the academy and in the nonprofit art world that I've worked in, you know, those contexts are really saturated with these bourgeois myths about art. Um, like the idea that art occupies some separate realm and, from the rest of the social world, or that the most it could offer us would be a kind of space for the free play of the imagination that is unencumbered by the material realities that we face in daily life, right? And I think one of the reasons why this ideological understanding of art is so pervasive in capitalist culture is that one of the things it does is it obscures the use that ruling classes have always made of art to secure and legitimate their power. When people ask if art can really affect the world, I think, well, if it couldn't, why is it that the ruling class is so interested in controlling it, right? Why did they use it to stoke nationalism and sell wars? Now they produce movies with billion dollar budgets to sell the idea that the only possible source of salvation must come through the divine intervention of heavily armored vigilantes or benevolent CIA officers. But instead, you know, as historical materialists, we understand that art like other aspects of culture, is a site and weapon of class struggle. Because artworks shape our consciousness, they are always implicated in ideological struggles that precede and exceed any given work of art. So ideology actively shapes our consciousness. It shapes the way we think and perceive by forging collective worlds of sense that make sense. And by make sense, I mean provide for a kind of practical consciousness that allows us to navigate the world, but that is nonetheless incoherent and contradictory. Um, th this contradictory consciousness is what the Italian communist philosopher Antonio Gramsci refers to as common sense. When he talks about how we are products of the historical process that has deposited in us an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. And Gramsci ju juxtaposes this idea of common sense to the need for developing what he calls good sense. And good sense is a critical consciousness and a coherent understanding of social reality, its contradictions, and the forces affecting its development. Socialist art can cultivate this kind of good sense. I think this is what the communist writer um, Bertolt Brecht meant when he wrote that socialist art should not only help us see differently, but see correctly. And he made clear that what is at stake in helping people correctly understand reality is helping them know how to act. Now there's a common critique of this argument that consists in saying, um, what gives the artist the authority to know what is correct? Isn't this saying that the artist or intellectual has a superior position to their audience? But this critique assumes an individual proprietary understanding of knowledge which is very much cultivated by liberal ideology and modern regimes of intellectual property. But Marxists, of course, understand that knowledge is collectively produced, as are the techniques and forms for its communication. Therefore, some artists are able to contribute more correct analyses of reality precisely because they are part of movements or parties that are generating this knowledge and also creating conditions for it to be received as knowledge. Now, I also want to note here that the insistence that art should help people understand the contradictions and forces shaping reality is not a prescri prescription for a certain aesthetic style or a, a, a particular form. The artistic means to help people see correctly must be chosen or invented based on the needs of the struggle at hand. And we can see this in the, so the history of socialist art in Cuba, which has always been characterized by its openness to experimentation and its wide range of styles. And as Brecht argued, stylistic innovation in socialist art has a political purpose. He argues that artistic forms must be dynamic, 
because reality is dynamic and some forms lose their effectiveness as situations change. Now, bourgeois ideology also works to isolate individual artworks from the institutionalized structures in which they are produced and to cast artists as paradigmatically free subjects rather than acknowledge their location within class relations and the consequences this has for their practice. This can lead to an impoverished and romantic account of the politics of art and also can lead to a lack of appreciation for the practical challenges of producing and disseminating truly revolutionary art in capitalist societies given that the means of cultural production are owned by our class enemies. Now, the expansion of democracy in the 20th century, well, of course, was accompanied not only by the growth of corporate power, but also its concentration over the means of cultural production. So when we account for this, we can see the forces working to keep artists and other intellectuals in what Che Guevara famous, famously referred to as our invisible cages. In his essay, Socialism and Man in Cuba, Che wrote brilliantly about the condition of artists under capitalism. He wrote, the superstructure imposes a kind of art in which the artist must be educated. Rebels are subdued by the machine, and only exceptional talents may create their own work. The rest become shamefaced hirelings or are crushed. Those who play by the rules of the game are showered with honors, such honors as a monkey might get for performing pirouettes. <laughs> The condition is that one does not try to escape from the inv invisible cage. And of course, one of the most consequential ways the cultural apparatus shapes culture is by controlling who, or more precisely, what class or class fraction can even gain access to means of cultural production or be socially recognized as artists. So the class character of the cultural apparatus creates practical challenge for the challenges for the production and distribution of revolutionary art within capitalist societies. And it has also spurred artists and other cultural workers in these societies to transform the very social relations of artistic production and distribution. This takes many forms, including labor struggles and contestations of property regimes within cultural institutions. And in other cases, cultural workers create alternative ways of producing and disseminating art that are not controlled by the bourgeois cultural apparatus. This very exhibition and the institutions that have organized it and are now hosting it are excellent examples of this kind of alternative cultural infrastructure that can support the, support the production and dissemination of knowledge and culture that has real use value for socialist struggle. In situations where workers' parties have seized control of the state, they have been able to transform the relations of cultural production in far more dramatic and wide-ranging ways. And of course, we could think here of the epic literacy campaigns carried out by the Cuban Revolution, or its creation of a formidable nationwide cultural infrastructure that democratized culture, that broke away from neocolonial cultural domination and isolation, and fostered an internationalist revolutionary culture, both nationally and around the world. Culture has been at the heart of the Cuban Revolution. In 1999, Fidel famously said, quote, a revolution can only be the child of culture and ideas. Writers at the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research have explained Fidel's thinking on this topic when they argue that a revolution will never be complete or lasting if it does not give a decisive role to education and culture. It is necessary to change human beings' conditions of material life, and it is necessary to simultaneously change the human being, their conscience, paradigms, and values. And art clearly can play and has played an important role in this transformation. So now I want to introduce the other speakers. Um, first, Quentin Maldonado is going to speak. And Quentin is a multidisciplinary artist based in Philadelphia. His works use elements of video, light installation, and sound to explore ideas of time, alienation, and spirituality. He received his MFA in photography from the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in 2020. And after Quentin speaks, then Hannah Priscilla Craig is going to speak. Hannah is an artist, a designer, performer, and an organizer directed to building movements of art and culture on the left. She is one of the organizers of this exhibition as well. She is the art space coordinator at the People's Forum in New York and a communications strategist with the International People's Assembly, a network of over 200 trade unions, political parties, and movement organizations in every region of the world. So I'll turn it over to Quentin.
Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to give a thank you to the Liberation Center and the People's Forum for putting on this wonderful show. Uh, specifically, Talia and Jasper, who have been really uh, just killing it. Down here. Uh, Y'all have no idea what this room looked like, what some of you do, but oh my god, the transformation. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal practice, a little bit about uh, art uh, in my own personal experience and what the possibility of like, I don't know, creative production or creative expression under socialism uh, has the potential to be. And so, uh, as was stated, I got my MFA in photography, which is a little bit of a joke because I didn't do that much photography when I was in school. Uh, I'm primarily, let's say, more of an installation and video artist. And the thing that I really like about installation is installation gives us a sort of relationship of space, and it gives us a ability to be present. Uh, whereas the video work that I try and do oftentimes explores our relationship with technology, spirituality, uh, and the ways in which those two things sometimes interlock but also uh, distance one another. And so the first note that I have here on my uh, speech is I want to talk about time and because to me, time is one of the most important parts of works that I respond to. And under capitalism, our time is highly segmented. It's rationalized into this thing that is always being consumed. It's always being used. We have, uh, come on. <laughs> uh, it's also like, increasingly segmented in which it is broken up into smaller and smaller moments. More and more of it is kept track in such a way that uh, it's all supposed to essentially be productive. Even in our free time, we are spending a lot of it just uh, consuming other things. There is this kind of uh, drive to be a part of conversations. It is a drive to consume the most recent thing, to maximize the most amount of life that you can out of the experience of your own life. Uh, and I think that this is a very, like, it's a highly alienating experience because we, I think it gives people the sense that they don't actually participate in their own life. They are just kind of moving along in it. And so it also, makes it so that we never experience boredom. Boredom is this kind of, boredom and slowness are these two things that are like antithetical to capitalist production insofar as like boredom is this space in which we kind of feel ourself. It's like those moments in which like uh, you can hear your own thoughts be in your own mind a little bit, and sometimes we try and run away from that because it feels so foreign to us. Uh, but it's also a place in which like desire kind of comes out. These sort of like moments in which like inspiration to go beyond what is given uh, can manifest because we have the time to reflect on ourselves. Uh, but it also leads me into thinking about alienation and spirituality, uh, especially in the artistic experience or like the aesthetic experience, there's like a, Walter Benjamin talks about the aura and aura is this thing that is constantly dissipating from our lives and it's because uh, as more and more of the world turns into consumable content, these things in which like are not supposed to be like felt but just supposed to be experienced, uh, our actual connection to the world around us, to the things that we are looking at, the places that we are in, like 
they dissipate. And so, and art does have this possibility in which there is a reflected sense of like, one's alienation that is objectified in the art. We see it out there in the world. It feels the way that we feel, but also the possibility to, or that experience also allows us the recognition or like the possibility of a greater connection. Like we're looking into somebody's mind there. We're, look, we're feeling their own thoughts. Uh, and so I think that it's, it's a dual struggle in that sense. And so it makes me think about, under the possibility of socialism, there is a kind of liberation of leisure time, or like the possibility of actually living our own lives, to indulge in our uh, sense of just humanity uh, in a way in which doesn't need to be exploitative. Whereas much of our own passions and pleasures and experiences now, we recognize as being connected to a greater system of exploitation that the dissipation of that exploitation means that we don't have to feel bad. We can actually enjoy thoroughly our own possibilities, our own creative expressions. But it also uh, means the possibility of the end of art, I think. But when I say the end of art, in, in a similar way to like the end of history, as like this potential of feeling beauty in one's own life, rather than it being a thing that is experienced out there that we have recognition of but never feel inside. There is the end of art as an object, but rather artistic living, that one feels connected to the people around them, the spaces that they are in. And this gives them a new renewed sense of creativity, but also like that spiritual dissipation is no longer there because we recognize our own meaning and humanity in one another. And so, oh, I have one other note here that I should have talked about. Uh, there's a lot to do about this notion of like, uh, I think, especially in our hustle and grind mindset nowadays, there is this kind of sense that uh, it's a very conservative notion of like, idle hands create sinfulness, that like, if I'm not working, if I'm not <coughs> producing, if I'm not doing something, then I'm wasting. All of that energy is just like, going nowhere, it's just going into the ether, it's not coming back to me in any sort of way. Uh, but rather, I would wanna posit that the opposite is oftentimes true, that to be able to feel yourself, to be able to, express in a way that feels connected to the people around you, it opens up all new opportunities for a greater sense of connectivity. And you all of a sudden want to do those things. You feel a drive towards creation rather than this like burden of the necessity of consumption. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over. Well, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you, Jennifer and Quinn, for, for opening this up and, and bringing all of these discussions about art, both historic and today, the way we practice art into the space. I am so, so excited to see these 12 beautiful um, prints in this space. It's really incredible to see all of the work that the, the Philly Liberation Center has put into making this exhibition a reality. Um, I'm going to go into more of you know, where this ex exhibition started and what its process was, but I just want to really thank 
the center for bringing it to Philly and, um, and just acknowledge how incredible it is to see this work here. Um, and, and tonight I, I'm really excited to talk about the future, actually. Um, I think that when we talk about building works of art that are connected to struggle, we're talking about building a future. We're talking about building our own future. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means, what it looks like where we, when we build art that is connected to our struggles, how we build it, some proposals for how we could think about the construction of art in, in our movements, and then to get into some of the specifics of vital lines and what the process was to build this exhibition. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about art and struggle. So when we talk about art, or we think about art and culture and its relation to people's movements, we're really talking about weapons, and this is something that Jennifer mentioned as well. But how is that? What, is, what are these weapons that we're wielding? So much of our work as organizers, as people who are part of movements that are, that are building or shifting culture, has to do with the way we propose what a new culture could look like. A lot of, I mean, we can all say there are so many problems with the system that we have today. There are, it's so obvious, all of the, all of the problems that we, that we see under capitalism. But with, with uh, the production of art and culture, we can really think about how and show, show how culture, how culture can change um, and how the world can change based on how we from how we show uh, uh, the world can change. And the ruling class recognizes this power of art and culture too, which is why, just like Jennifer said, there, have been, there has been so many resources that have been dumped into creating, um, to creating artworks that, that, can, that hold up the ruling class's um, stranglehold on, on art and culture. You know, the, the, the movie industry, but also the, the kind of mainstream art industry really shows that so clearly. Uh, or sometimes not so clearly, and we have to dig it out a little bit. But you end up seeing, oh, okay, this is really the ruling class um, that is holding on to, to this culture. But it doesn't have to be that way. And as, as people who are on the left, it's so important that we're intervening and that we use that weapon of culture to build our movements up. So, I want to, in order to talk about building the future, I, I want to also look towards the past. Of course, this is part of a, a Marxist method, is, is always being in the process of understanding the world around us and our, our conditions that shape um, the historic and the present reality that we're in. So, I want to talk about somebody who, who did build the future in some capacity, and that's Fidel Castro, who is in, of course, one of the prints that we have on the wall by Vivek Venkatraman. He said in 1998 to the Young Communist League of Cuba, ideas are not simply an instrument to build consciousness and lead people to fight, but they have become the main weapon of struggle. Of course, he was also inspired by another Cuban revolutionary, Jose Marti, who is a... a uh, revolutionary and a, a poet, and he said, trenches made of ideas are stronger than those made of stones. So when we talk about building and creating revolutionary art and culture, we're talking about participating in the battle of ideas, in showing, um, explaining, talking, and building an idea of what the world could look like without capitalism and, and with socialism. So, in our current moment, we have to think about how we can engage in the battle of ideas. But not only the battle of ideas, we're not, it's not only about understanding the world around us, but we also have to think about how to engage in the battle of emotions, what really makes us feel how can we, uh, it's, it's like the feeling that you get when you're out. I think a lot of us felt this in 2020, when we're out in the streets and all of a sudden everyone starts singing at the same time. There were some amazing songs that became really popular during the uprisings of 2020. And it's that feeling that you get. It's almost like in the pit of your stomach, like you're ready to struggle and you're ready to fight and you're ready to win. 
And it's that, it's those, it's that emotion that we have to figure out how to um, wield as a weapon in, in the way that we're constructing our movements. So all that to say, I want to talk a little bit about the construction of Vital Lines itself. So this project um, was one that was conceived in November of 2021 to build stronger lines of solidarity, especially in cultural movements and spaces, between artists in Cuba and the US. So the project happened out of the People's Forum, which is a cultural um, and educa popular education space in New York. And we wanted to make space for artists on the left to collaborate, communicate, and meditate on themes related to the successes of the Cuban Revolution despite a six decade long um, strangle, strangling US blockade. So we connected with six artists in Cuba who are Aldo Cruces, Aristides Torres, Greta Acosta Reyes, uh, Calia Leon, and Carla Gomez. And six artists in the U.S., Andrew Nance, Carolina Vega, Ian Matchett, Kimberly Barzola, Vienna Rai, and Vivek Venkatraman to, um, to work together. So we paired these artists together, one uh, artist from the U.S. and one artist to Cuba, in Cuba, and we asked them to collaboratively discuss the theme which was assigned to them. So those, we assigned a theme to each artist pair. They were friendship, future, struggle, liberation, love, sovereignty, peace, and revolution. And then from there, we asked the artists to make their own work that was connected to the theme, but also connected with the conversations and collaboration that had happened between the artists. So we left it really open to see how artists would, would want to collaborate, if they would want to send drawings back and forth, um, or, or what, other, uh, what other types of ways they would want to collaborate. Um, and the results were really interesting. Some artists faced a language barrier, um, so it was, it was maybe difficult for them to communicate. Of course, the blockade also makes it really difficult to communicate um, virtually in the way that we're kind of accustomed to here. You can't call, uh, you can't have a Zoom call, for example, because Zoom is, um, is blocked in Cuba. And so there are all of these sort of challenges, but despite these challenges, um, the artists were able to find ways to collaborate. Some of them sent drawings back and forth to each other as their form of collaboration. Some of them um, did, did Google translations and emailed each other back and forth. And some of them actually were able to call and to talk over the phone and, and they discuss these themes that they, were, um, that they were thinking about in terms of the revolution. Um, and in, in this way, even though the blockade continues to hold onto the, the and make such a horrible impact, um, the artists were able to almost like break past some aspects of the blockade that, that often keeps us um, from recognizing or understanding the real situation on the ground in Cuba. So after this collaboration happened, the individual artists produced their artworks and sent their artworks to the People's Forum where we printed their works in uh, in-house, uh, in the as two color screen prints, which you see here in the Elizabeth Catlett Art Space and Printmaking Studio, there were there were um, fifty copies that were made, um, all completely by hand, and uh, and then all of the artists, of course, received copies of their of their works, and we had the exhibition uh, shown in the People's Forum last year, and then at uh, the People's Summit for Democracy in Los Angeles, um, which was a counter summit to Biden's Summit of the Americas. And so, um, again, really excited to have these artworks in the space in Philly as well. Um, so the idea and the hope that we have with, with building this project is that it sparks um, more collaborations. We I'm, I'm really excited to imagine all of the ways that we can envision building new kinds of, uh, of solidarity work that can happen not only in Cuba, but with other movements um, internationally, thinking about building um, art projects and works that can intervene in cultural spaces and, uh, and continue to build our movements. So with that, I want to open it up. Uh, I have a little 
activity that we can do together. So it, it's not it's not an activity that you can be judged on or anything. But um, if people want to get into pairs, the idea is that just like the artists were paired together um, in twos, we can also think about these themes that the artists were thinking about when they were in the process of creating these works. And so. The six themes that the artists were given are on that piece of paper. So with your uh, with your partner, you can kind of think about the questions that are written there and think about the, the ways that the artworks make you think about some of these elements of the Cuban Revolution um, and, and things that stand out to you. So thank you again to, to Quentin, to Jennifer, to the whole center, to Jasper. Um, to Talia for all of this incredible work and really excited to, to have the art here and to continue the conversation. Okay.